Uh, so I'd like to say hello to all. And on behalf of the Region of Three Oaks Museum, thank you for attending. I'm Nick Bogert, a museum board member. And uh, again, please do keep microphones muted during the presentation. If questions do occur to you during the talk, now I'm having a little issue with changing. Okay. Hmm. All right. It, the, uh, if questions occur to you during the talk, you can click on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen uh, and you can write them out and then I can answer those questions uh, later on at the end of the talk. So 19 North Elm Street has now been turned into a pricey restaurant and food and wine shop known as Fralix. But many of us grew up knowing 19 North Elm as a down home department store. It was built as was almost everything in town in the early 1900s by the Warren Featherbone Company, Three Oaks largest, by far largest employer. Uh, the Charles K. Warren Company was, store was part of the Featherbone Manufacturing Complex, which dominated the village from 1900 on. And Charles K. Warren was built in 1910. If you look closely, you can see an enclosed walkway leading from the second floor of the Featherbone factory <clears throat> onto the second floor of the department store, where in fact manufacturing machinery for the Featherbone Company was set up, even when there was a store below. Now in the spring of 1910, <clears throat> the opening of a new department store in town was the headline for weeks, and perhaps that's not surprising, since the Warren Featherbone Company owned the Acorn newspaper. The coverage though was unrestrained in its enthusiasm. <clears throat> We intend to open in a few weeks, one of the best equipped department stores to be found in any town under 5,000 population in the state. Everything will be new and up to the minute in style. We have no old goods to show you at any price. The new store offered a contest with cash prizes for local farmers. $10 for the farmer who brought the largest number of customers from three to five miles away. $12 for the farmer with the biggest gaggle of shoppers from six to 10 miles away, and $15 for the most folks brought from 11 to 15 miles distant. When Charles K. Warren and company finally opened in late March of 1910, it looked a little like a movie premiere. The crowds came and they dressed up for the occasion. No surprise given the amount of publicity in the local newspaper and the magnificence of the building itself. When Charles K. Warren finally opened, I'm sorry, undeniably this was a glamorous shopping spot for a place like Three Oaks. At that point, the village was about 1,200 people, the township about 2,000. Both of those figures about 500 less than the current population. And as for that bring a big crowd contest, the farmers took it seriously. The winner brought 116 people to shop during C. K. Warren's opening week. By the way, the farmer did not have to provide or didn't have to buy anything to win the contest, but his passengers did have to buy their names and addresses to store personnel. And the C.K. Warren store did a lot of postcard marketing in subsequent years. So let's talk about C.K. Warren himself. Charles K. Warren was the eldest son of Edward K. Warren, the inventor of Featherbone, his favorite son, according to some. And Charles was groomed and to take over the, his father's Featherbone empire going to a prep school in the East. However, Charles Warren, having worked on a farm in Missouri when he was 16 years old for several months, had other ideas that involved going West. He went to Texas at age 19 in 1890 or so, and Ray Hoffman, a longtime uh, Warren Featherbone employee, talked about that trip in 1973. Uh, went down there and uh, he worked on some ranches, I guess, and he got the fever, that is the ranching fever and come back and I guess talk to his father and investing some money in the first ranch down home. Would you know why he went down in the first place? Was he just a young boy looking for yeah, just work? excitement. Excitement. Yeah, uh, yeah he was a... Uh, wanted to be a cowboy. Yeah, he wanted to be a cowboy and of course the probably stories of the old west and that sort of thing intrigued him and it got to the point where he went, he almost, I guess, partly ran away from home, what, didn't he? Well, I think Just he did, wow. yeah. And it was down there, I don't know how many years, not too many years, but not too many. when he came back to Three Oaks here, he got off the train and he had cowboy chaps on and the whole oh. <laughs> yeah. He really got, uh, was enthused with the Southwest. 
So Charlie Warren had been working as a salesman for the Featherbone Company when he decided to head to Texas and hire himself out as a cowboy at the Square and Compass Ranch, where other cowboys called him the Colonel because he'd arrived on the ranch in a suit and a derby hat and patent leather shoes and a white shirt. Charles wrote letters back to his father in Three Oaks, who one imagines was both annoyed and uh, somewhat concerned about his son's sudden infatuation with the cowboy life. Charles tried to reassure his father, <clears throat> who was a devout Congregationalist, cards and whiskey are forbidden on the ranch. So you can see, as long as a man stays away from town, he is far from many temptations. I shall be careful in habits, etc., and not go to town with the boys. So please don't worry. And he continued, Father, it is a grand sight to see the cattle on a night. There is something fascinating about it all. Charles implored, implored his father to get into cattle ranching, and E.K. was already quite successful and did have some money. But after several months on the range, Charles did return to Three Oaks with chaps on, as you may have heard in that audio. About a decade later, he would finally persuade his father to get into cattle ranching in Texas. Starting in 1903, the Warrens would begin buying West Texas ranch land dubbing their holdings the Mule Shoe Ranch, and that is the brand that they would use on their cattle there at the bottom. Their first holdings were northwest of Lubbock, near the Texas-New Mexico border, and the town of Mule Shoe is in fact still there. It's the county seat of Bailey County, Texas. Eventually, the Warrens would expand their ranch holdings into New Mexico and the Mexican state of Chihuahua, owning, according to the Galeen River Gazette, nearly a million acres. The Warrens south of the border operations were bedeviled by both sides during the Mexican Revolution. Ranch foreman Bunk Spencer was kidnapped six times, had to be ranch, ransomed twice, and was eventually killed by bandits. Still, the cattle ranching operations were profitable. Raising uh, beef cattle in Mexico was extremely cheap. So eventually, Charles did fulfill his Wild West cattle dreams. But when he returned to Three Oaks in 1891, his father put Charles in charge of Oak Meadow Farm, east of Three Oaks. He could wear his cowboy hat while he was tending the land there. And there were some cattle around, though they were dairy cattle and not beef cattle, and there were no opportunities to drive the herd across Western landscapes. Oak Meadow lacked a lot of the romance of Texas. But Charles made the family's agriculture operations pay off. He developed new crops. He produced mint for a while, selling it to the Wrigley Chewing Gum people in Chicago. He uh, eventually, Warren family farming operations in this area expanded to 2,000 acres. Charles and his wife Fan Fanny lived at Elmont, a beautiful home that still stands on US 12, just a few hundred yards from Oak Meadow Farm. And eventually, Charles and Fanny had five children. And E.K. Warren gave his oldest son an increasing portfolio. In 1902, E.K. and C.K. Warren, along with a local butcher, an Englishman named Alec Watson, formed the banking company E.K. Warren and Company. A quick aside about Alec Watson, a decade after partnering with the Warrens on a bank, Watson sold his butcher shop to the clerk who had started out as his delivery boy. That was Ed Dreyer, the little boy on the right in this picture. And three generations later, of course, the Dreyer still run that shop. Charles Warren also took over management of the Featherbone factories in the early 1900s as his father Sammy retired and grew more involved in church activities and travel. Now, if your factories are employing almost everyone in town and they deposit their paychecks in your bank, the next step, of course, is to give them somewhere to spend it. So back to Charles K. Warren and Company store. It was not built from scratch. The Warren Company had bought out the owners of existing grocery, hardware, and clothing stores and put them all under one roof and they installed the other store's operators as their department managers. Now we had some fun looking at the prices that were charged back in 1910 when Charles K. Warren opened. How much do you figure a lawnmower would go for back then? Well, up to $6 for the model that is ball bearing and has four knives. How about a Lincoln coal burning stove? Well, that went for $41.75. That was a lot of money in those days. But the ad said that this was in fact a stove fit for people of good character. So you don't want to skimp there, I guess. Now, as for clothing, a lady's shirt waist was on sale for 79 cents, regularly a dollar to a dollar 25. 
and men's suits, they were having a big sale, less than $15 went on sale. Early on, the C.K. Warren store motto was the most of the best for the least. And they were by far the biggest advertiser in the Acorn newspaper, offering lots of seasonal specials. The month of May promised lots of specials to help with spring cleaning activity. A few weeks later, an ad addressed to graduates played on teenage vanity. You know it's impossible to feel just right if you even mistrust that possibly your costume might have been improved upon. We can set your mind at ease. In the dog days of summer, C.K. Warren's store was offering a baseball and bat to kids who came into the store and also brought one of the advertising icons of the age, Buster Brown and his dog Tig, to the store to highlight the virtues of Buster Brown shoes and kids were promised free souvenirs. Now that stove for the people of good character was offered on sale as autumn's cool days descended upon Three Oaks. And year's end, of course, meant that Santa Claus was coming to town by train, the 519 from Chicago to be precise. And the next edition of the Acorn had an ad asking kids if they'd been there to see Santa, to hug him, to observe the twinkle in his eye. If not, the ad let them know that he would be at the store on Friday and Saturday afternoon, 4 to 6 p.m. C.K. Warren and Company was a go-to store for most everything for more than two decades in Three Oaks. But it was hit hard by the Depression, and the store was again broken up with the departments becoming separate stores. In 1934, John Honeyager, who had been the manager of the menswear department at C.K. Warren for more than two decades, took over the bulk of the business at 19 North Elm. He renamed it the Three Oaks Department Store. Honeyager, with his wife Clara doing the books, ran that store for about two decades. A 1947 article in the Galeen River Gazette, written by their daughter-in-law, Tanya, reported that the Honeyagers didn't take a vacation until 1945, some 11 years after they bought the department store. An employee named Paul Hepler wrote about working for the Honeyagers in the 1940s, and he described the store. Upon entering, one found the ladies' merchandise down the left side, notions, trims, bolts of fabric, lingerie, well hidden, and ready to wear, with children's clothes to the rear. Local goods included the ubiquitous Cora Seal baby pants. So Cora Seal was a, uh, an early plastic uh, compound that was made, uh, uh, was made by the, the Warren Featherbone Company, used it in making baby pants and other uh, plastic items. So baby pants, bibs, bias tapes, and rickrack, more Warren uh, goods. The latter produced by the clattering factory machines on the second floor. In fact. The right front featured men's and boys clothing, custom suiting, en row shorts, formal hats, accessories, and work clothes. Halfway down was the shoe department with swivel chair and wild wire-legged fitting stools, serving men with floor shine shoes, Wolverine boots, and four buckle galoshes. The vast open plan was made more spacious by a tall ceiling laced with pipes and periodic drop loads of light that punched holes in the gloom and made shopping something of a romantic adventure. It did also prompt shoppers, however, <clears throat> to carry items to the front windows at times just to see the exact match of color. Now in the mid 40s, fluorescent light was installed as you can see here in the photo. Saturday nights, wrote Paul Hepler, the original shopping night of custom for local citizens and area farmers. I always dress as for church, shiny shoes, coat and tie for the end of the week trade, the upstairs machines being quiet, bringing a civilized aspect to the business. Of his boss, Hepler said, though, some, though thought by some to be parsimonious, J.H. taught me the value of industry and retailing, respect for the wishes of customers, tact and patience at a time when it was valuable. Now, John Honeyager had three children who also worked at the store as kids. There was Marianne, who later became Marianne Martin. She worked as a fashion buyer for the store before having children. There was John Jr. and also Bob, another son, who married a woman named Charlotte. And they together took over the store from their father in the early 1950s, renaming it Honeyager's. John stayed until 1967 when he became a high school teacher in Glean. So Bob and his wife Charlotte ran the store for about three decades until 1983. That's a picture of them in the 80s on the right. And they were musicians. 
he had a master's degree in the performing arts and played the violin in local symphonies. I'm not sure how much you can see of the violin in these shots, but he is holding one there. And uh, there was an article written about an appearance in Fort Wayne. Bob was in fact, however, the concert master of the Elkhart Symphony Orchestra. Charlotte played piano and sang, and they met when he was teaching music at Bob Jones University, and she was the Dean of Women there. They moved to Three Oaks in 1948, and the Galeen River Gazette reporting that Bob had resigned his position as Chief Air Traffic Controller at LaGuardia Airfield in New York, and that he'd worked in control towers in five other cities. This was an unconventional career path, to be sure. Bob and John Honeyager did not change much the look or feel of the father's store. Bob was quoted as saying over the years, the appearance of the store is kept to the old fashioned country store as is practical. And we tried to preserve the old look even when it wasn't fashionable. But the Honeyagers did often tout the fashions that they offer. They held fashion shows uh, locally with, at various venues around the area, Chickaming Country Club, local church halls. Uh, they held some in the museum, what was then known as the museum building, which is now the Three Oaks Library, uh, and at the gym at Three Oaks High. And at the, at the uh, current museum, we found a treasure trove of slides from these 1950s fashion shows. The Honeyager brothers, that's Bob and then John in the middle, and their father, John, on the right, hosted these events. And the men, women, and children of Three Oaks wore the fashions. And they walked the runway. Some people might recognize uh, Mike Heckathorn in the red jacket there, looking perhaps less than thrilled at being on stage. We mentioned that uh, Bob and Charlotte Honeyager had musical talent, and music appears to have been a big part of these shows. That singer Alice Ralston, backed by Bob Honeyager on the violin, Rosemary Heckathorn on the piano, Paul Witt on the bass, and Chet Decker on the banjo. Now, another feature of these fashion shows that's jarring to the, uh, the modern eye is people performing in blackface. Judging by the collection of slides that we have at the museum, these shows were, in fact, well attended. Some of the shows were for women only because they featured various undergarments. Bob and Charlotte Honeyager did not have children of their own, but they always ran ads in the backs of Three Oaks and then River Valley High School yearbooks. Those ads featured female members of the graduating class, and those students were frequently looking over the merchandise with Charlotte Honeyager. In 1983, the South Bend Tribune was reporting that a piece of Three Oaks history will soon pass, that Bob and Charlotte Honeyager would be retiring, as they put it, before the snow flies. The couple, pictured at the old-fashioned cash registers that still rang up purchases at Honeyager's until the end, expressed hope that someone might take over the store, and they said they would offer all the old furnishings along with the building. The Honeyagers then retired to Fort Myers, Florida. Bob died in 2005 and Charlotte in 2008. The store did reopen as a department store eventually and very briefly. The T.L. Wood Company lasted only about a year. And then 19 North Elm housed the Three Oaks Pharmacy for many years, a giant drugstore that offered almost as many items as a department store, though with far fewer clothing options. After several years of renovation, uh, Nine North Elm now houses, I'm sorry, Nine North El 19 North Elm now houses Freilich's Kitchen Pantry. At this point, not serving meals or hosting events inside the building, though I understand it is available for takeout meals, as are uh, many restaurants offering that. So with that, we come up to date. And I'll answer any questions that I can in just a moment. If you want to ask something, you can click on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen again and type in the question. Before the Q&A, though, I do want to take a few minutes to talk about the museum's purchase of Three Oaks Old Township Hall. Built in 1866, it is the oldest building in the village and the home of the original government in town. It's also the place where villagers, led by E.K. Warren, mounted the Three Oaks Against the World fundraising campaign, which in 1899 brought 15 minutes of national fame to Three Oaks, as well as the Dewey Cannon, 
after they won the fundraising prize. It provided a sanctuary for parishioners at St. Mary's after their church burned down Christmas of 1944. So the museum stepped in and purchased the building in March to preserve a vital piece of local heritage, and we hope to renovate the inside to get rid of the particle board and restore the interior, and then put this building to a good public use. We are asking for your suggestions as to what might be done with that building. We're also asking that you contribute money to make whatever is done happen. And you can send the suggestions and the donations, which are tax deductible, to the museum at P.O. Box 121 in Three Oaks, 49128. Any help you can give will be more than appreciated. Uh, thanks to all those who have given already. We've received more than 20 checks since our fundraising emails and letters went out. And if you meant to donate uh, but haven't gotten around to it, I will leave that address up for a little while while I address the questions. And now, I see Martha's raised her hand, so let me see what I can... I'm trying to... Uh, I said I would leave that up, but I'm trying to figure out how to get to the, uh, the chat function. My limitations on... Uh, Okay, so there's the chat right here. Oh, lost the audio. Did everybody get the sound back? Can everybody hear me now? Uh, you can message, message if you can hear yeah, me. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. We can okay. hear you, Nick. All right. Um, all right, but I don't have any questions. Time for applause. Yay! <laughs> all right, time for applause. It's okay too. Yay! Um, all right. Anyway, uh, next time you go in that building and have a uh, a hamburger or pasta or whatever, you'll uh, you'll know something more about the background of the place. So, Nick, my chronology is totally skewed, and I may be way off base. But okay. Harold Swift, who is the meat packing man, how did he have any interaction with the? cowboy wrangler uh people that were in three oaks and was there any back and forth or was he just a summer guy and and, and maybe the maybe the timing what didn't line up at all but my my guess is that he uh that he knew the warrens um ek warren had a house in uh, lakeside called vine cottage and it was kind of down where the stop sign is where lakeside road and lakeshore road meet each other um and E.K. Warren actually, uh, again, later on when he grew near retirement age, he, he lived mostly in Evanston. He'd come to Vine Cottage in Lakeside for his summers, and he would leave Charlie Warren, the would-be cowboy, to manage the factory operations. Um, E.K. Warren's uh, son, let me see, yes, his son Fred married Estelle Rookheim of the Cracker Jack people. And the uh, Estelle Rookheim's family had a house that is just north of my house in Lakeside. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, on Cracker Jack Lane, as you, some of you may know. So the, the, the Warrens were, in fact, uh, around Lakeside and Three Oaks quite a bit. So my guess is that at some point, uh, well, I take it back because Harold Swift didn't, build, uh, didn't buy his house here until 1923, and E.K. Warren died in 1919. He may well have known. Fred Warren and Estelle, he may well have known Charlie Warren, but he did not know. So him. that's my chronology getting mixed up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Is, Lo is Long Acre a Warren property? Uh, Long Acre, I believe, was built by the Chamberlain family. E.K. Warren was married to, uh, what was her first name? Sarah Chamberlain. He was married to the daughter of Henry Chamberlain. Henry Chamberlain was the original settler of Three Oaks, Michigan. He lived in New Buffalo and he got a contract to provide lumber to the railroad. And he, uh, he was the first person to live there full time. Uh, and then he, I believe he built Long Acre, um, which is, again, in Lakeside, uh, north of downtown. Ask him. No. Uh, Nick? I yes. have a question, uh, Nick, in that what a lovely production. I didn't get to see the full piece because um, I was picking up dinner. But what a beautiful production and are you going i see you're recording this so are you going to be able to present this leave it online because i think there's some who would love to see this i'm glad you mentioned it. i should have mentioned it before um yes it's recording and what i'll do is i'll take that recording and i'll i'll edit down the first part where people were just waiting because it started recording the moment you log into the meeting 
So I'll chop off that part and I will put it online. The link will be on uh, the museum's website, which is which is of three oaks museum.com. So I'll have a link to the presentation there. And if you want to tell friends and neighbors, I know some people uh, look at these afterwards in our in our age of video on demand. Nick. Yeah. Me? Susan? Hi, Susan. Sure. Hi. 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 Um, I know a feather bone is made out of a turkey feather, but what do they do to it? Uh, they, they shred it. Essentially, they take the spine of the turkey feather, they yeah. shred it, and then they take the, the small uh, threads of it and reweave it back into something that's a, a cloth-covered tape about that wide. And that's what the corset stiffener is and the collar stiffener and, and all those ah, other things. Ah, okay. And, and they even made, again, they made uh, buggy whips out of, out of feather bone along with corset stays and, and collar stays and that sort of thing. Yeah. And Did they farm turkeys? Um, I don't think they had to. I don't, I don't recall uh, ever hearing that they farmed turkeys. The story about the invention of feather bone is that E.K. Warren, who ran a general store at the time, went to Chicago to buy feather dusters, to the Chicago Feather Duster Factory. And there he saw feathers that were being thrown away. I can't remember the oh. name of the feathers, but they're on the front part of the wing, and they're not uh, bushy enough, I guess, to be very good for dusting. So they were throwing them away and said, what are you doing with those? And they said, oh, we just tossed them. And I guess his brain got to work and he'd gotten a number of complaints about uh, the corset stiffeners, which were made out of whalebone. Uh, and whalebone apparently dries out and cracks after a while so that the girdles that he was selling his customers were becoming defective after a while. And the other thing was that because petroleum had been discovered, there was less whaling going on. So the price of whalebone was going up because people weren't seeking whale oil. So uh, the price was going up and the product was not so good. So E.K. Warren had an idea and he made, he boasted to his housekeeper at one point that he made 50 cents every time the clock ticked. So he was a very rich man. <laughs> what estate, a clever I was, man. I think his estate was $7 million uh, when he died and in 1919 dollars. That's yeah. I can't remember the, what the translation is, but it's several hundred million. Wow. Um, yeah. Great presentation. Well, thank you. And Thank you all. I, I envy you, Susan. You're sitting by palm trees. That looks nice. <laughs> uh, I was going to tell you Lake Robert <laughs> would be proud of you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> anyway, if there aren't any other questions, I guess I will leave you to your Friday night and thank you all for attending. <laughs>